him to express his fundamental creed, and the easiest thing in the world that minute would have been to start him slitting Hindu throats. Together thou and I will beard the nine unknown. He boasted, we nine will show the rest the way. By Allah, he was working himself up to prodigies of boasting, to be followed certainly by equally prodigious feats, for that is how swashbuckling propagates itself, and no mistake is greater than to think swashbuckling is unimportant, the world's red history has been written with its sword points. Thou and I. But there came interruption. One of his sons arrived, striding like a hillman up the stairs and touching nothing with his garments, as a cat can go through undergrowth. A young man, with his beard not more than quilling out. Now we shall know, said Ali, and King took the youngster's elbow, swinging him into the midst, where he stood self-consciously. Where is the Portuguese? King asked him, the Portuguese. Ali of Sikandurim, magnificently posing, scratched his beard and grew increasingly aware of anticlimax as the meaning of the question was explained. The youngest of the seven sons with his spurs to win and no more than a murder yet to his credit seemed to be lagging behind opportunity for God was stupid. Oh, ah, yes, that little yellow man him with the little black beard and the black coat dogama him you mean. How should I know where he is? Oh yes, I followed him a little way, but there were others who left this roost with him, carrying books and rolls and things like that. One beckoned me and ordered me to carry books. Ha, he was a Hindu by the look of him, a man in a yellow smock. Having received my answer, which was a good one, he acknowledged his mistake and paid me a compliment. He said he had not understood. He had been told that porters and dependable guards would come, and had mistaken me for a porter. He asked my forgiveness, standing in mid-street with his arms full of musty books what sort of books. Allah, how should I know? Not a Quran among them, you may be sure of that. I wasn't interested in his books he said that men would soon come from a house in the next street who would seek to kill him so would I go to that house he described it to me and an evil place it is and obstruct the men who came out quarreling if need be. Well that was a man's work and I went. I have just come from there. What of Dagama? What happened? Did you see the Portuguese? The questions came like pistol shots in several languages English, Punjabi, Pushtu, Hindustani. No, I don't know what became of the Portuguese. There was a woman there inside. I followed her in. Men came later, and I hamstrung one of them. When I can find my brothers we will all go to that house, and there will be happenings. There was nothing to be said. Not even Ali spoke a word. The youngster went rambling on, inventing things he might have said and deeds he might have done if he had thought of them at the time, until it slowly dawned on him that there was something lacking of enthusiasm in his audience. Ali did not even trust himself to utter a rebuke, and none else cared to. The vibrations of bitter disappointment if that is what they are made themselves felt at last, and the young man backed away, explaining to himself to the night at large. How should I have known? The man said he would carry books, and would I do the dangerous work? Am I a coward? How could I refuse him? And besides there came two others of the seven older men hard breathing, breaking out in sweat, and anxious for news of Abdullah the youngest. They had seen nothing of the Portuguese at all. In accordance with a plan, a perfect plan as they explained it, they had waited in the appointed shadows to see the Portuguese go by. There were only six streets he could take, and they had watched each one, leaving the youngest to tag along behind the Portuguese and act as communicating link. Whichever way the Portuguese should take, the brother whom he passed would follow, and Abdullah, the youngest, would run to inform the others. The plan was perfect. The Prophet himself could not have devised a better one. But Abdullah had not come. And another man had come, who said Abdullah was lying belly upward of a knife thrust in another street. So, they went to see, Solomon first finding Ahmed, so as to have company and help in case of a brawl. Not finding Abdullah they had come back. There is Abdullah, remarked Ali dryly. Beat him. Which they did, like the immortal 600 at Balaclava, there's not to reason why. They beat him to the scandal of a whole community that bivouacked on one roof, and rival roofs with no such violence to entertain them cat called comment to and fro, casting aspersions on the house and good name of Fernandez de Mendoza de Souza de Ong Braganza, who could not endure that in silence, naturally. He came up on the roof to investigate. Running into King and cannoning into Grim off Ramsden, Dion recognized the strangers who had invaded his hotel, paying money for unprofitable answers, and undoubtedly not sent by the police. That was enough. The stranger is the man to turn on, because the crowd is sure to back you up. Besides, he had their hundred rupees, which probably exhausted that source of revenue and the dry cow to the butcher, every time. 
Striking an attitude that would have cheapened Hector on the walls of Troy with his straight black hair and bristle like a parakeet's crest, Dion Berganza called on the honorable guests of his hotel to come and throw robbers off the roof, a dangerous summons on a hot night in a land where passion lies about skin deep and nearly all folk have a bone to pick with Providence. There had been enough North Country horseplay and enough meat tolerance for once. The women's voices chattered like a henry aroused at night, and the men responded from instinct and emotion, which combine into the swiftness and the fury of a typhoon. I am your servant. I have tried to make you comfortable. These ruffians are too many for me, shouted Diomed. Come and help me, noblemen my guests. They came with a rush, the nearest hesitating under cover of the flapping sheets until they saw and felt pressure behind them and the dam went down, not in a tide of courage but of anger with the racial rage on top, which is the swiftest of all, and the fiercest. That was no time to argue. Ramsden took Dion by thigh and shoulder, raised him overhead, and hurled him screaming and kicking into the thick of the assault to create a diversion if the half-breed had it in him. And he hadn't. He had shot his bolt and served his minute. Three or four went down under his impact, but the rest ignored him as the spade screams passed an obstacle. And there were knives, clubs, things thrown. Over and through and under all the noise there was a penetrating voice that prodded at the seat of anger. They are spies. They are government agents. Band Materum. Asterisk, asterisk, hail motherland. The slogan of the Indian nationalist. Ramsden held the stairhead for the others to back down one by one, King dragging Ali Ben Ali by wrist and neck to keep him from using his kyber knife that according to his own account of it had leapt from the sheath unbidden. Ali was not the first, at that, to blame his true reactions on to untrue circumstance. And even so, King only held him as you hold a hound in leash, until the moment which occurred when Grimm and Jeremy fell backward down the stairs together, struck by a bed hurled at random, wooden frame and loose, complaining springs that weren't like the devil in action. King dodged to avoid the thing, and Ali cut loose to uphold the testy honor of Sikandarum. So there was a scrimmage for a minute at the stairhead that beat football, Grimm and Jeremy returning, forcing their way upward to stand with their friends, and the others all in one another's way as each insisted on retreating last and all except Ali helped to plug the narrow exit. They had Ali's sons in the midst of them, for precaution, but that arrangement did not last long. Ali's kyber knife was wickering and working in the dark a stride or two ahead, and someone reached Ali with a long stick drawing blood. Ali yelled not a call for help exactly, yet the same thing, Akbar. Allahu Akbar, the challenging, unanswerable battle yell of Islam, naming two truths, one implied that God is great, and that the witness of it means to die there fighting. Might as well have tried to hold a typhoon then as Ali's three sons. There was one who had been beaten, with his pride, all raw, aspiring to be comforted in anybody's blood. He broke first, but the other two were only a fraction of a second after him, and there was a fight joined in the dark a dozen feet ahead, where men hurled broken lanterns, bed legs, copper cooking pots, friend hitting friend where a fool with a whistling chain lashed right and left and answering the Akbar. Akbar, Alamo Akbar, of Sikandarum there rose and fell the band Matarum, of someone prodding Sikh and Hindu passion. Hail Motherland! You can stir the leaves of almost any crowd with that cry. Thought of retreat had to go to the winds as King, Grim, Ramsden and Jeremy hurled themselves into the fray to disentangle Ali and his illegitimates, if possible as all things, of course, are possible to men whose guts are in the right place. Possible, but not so easy. It was dark, for one thing, all the lamps were smashed that had not been extinguished by the women, and Ali had deliberately struck to kill at least a dozen times, using the quick, upturning thrust that lets a victim's bowels out. There was blood in quantity that made the foot slip on the roof and, though it was impossible to see how many he had hit and his own count of a hundred was ridiculous there was no doubt of the rage for retaliation. The men in front were yelling to the men behind for light and longer weapons, and three or four came running with a pole like a phalanx spear, while shouts from below announced that some had fallen off the roof. Another shout, worse, wilder, turned that shambles into panic in which women fought men with their long pins for a footing on the stair. Fire! and the acrid, stringing smell of it before the cry had died away and left one man grim aware that he who had started the band, Materum, and he who had cried fire, were the same. It was the note of cynicism, the mechanical, methodical, exactly timed note, the note of near contemptuous understanding that informed Grin. Not that information did him any good, just then. There was a rush of panic-stricken brutes plunging deathward in the lust for mere life, screaming, stripping, scrambling, striking, tearing at the clothing of the ranks ahead, and the half and iron pipe that did for stairhead railing went down like a straw before it, so that men, women, children poured into the opening like meat into a hopper and there jammed, filling the jaws of death too fast. 
Others left on top of that, hoping to unplug the opening by impact, or perhaps beyond hope, crazed. There wasn't anything to do that could be done. No seven men in all the earth could tame that rush, not even Ramsden, who fought like old Horatius on the bridge across the Tiber, and was born hack on his heels until he swayed above the street and saved himself by a side leap along the low parapet. Then the smoke came, billowing upward all around the roof, and a scream arose from the people jammed in the stairhead song of a Charnel house. Hymn of the worst death, and an obligato made of crackling. Then the smell, as human flesh took fire, worse even than the screaming and the roar of flames. Through all that ran a bellowing incessant everlastingly repeated on another note than the mob yell from the street and the brazen gong of the arriving firemen penetrating through the scream and the increasing crash of timbers giving a direction through the choking smoke as a fog horned as at sea. Jim Grimm. Oh, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. Oh, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. It is I Narayan Singh. Come this way, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. Over and over again, unvarying, on one note, nasal, recognizable at last is bellowed through the brass horn of a phonograph the summons of a sane man in a sea of fear. Grim gathered the others. There was light now and a man could see, for the flames had burst the roof. Thirty or forty more of Dion Braganza's guests swooped this and that way in a herd like mercury on a tipping plate, and one cried that the bellowing through the trumpet was the voice of God. That was the end, of course. Fatalism multiplied itself with fear and they leapt, hand in hand some of them, some dead before they reached the street and others killing those they fell on. Sixty feet from coping down to pavement plenty for the providence that governs such things. Jim Grimm. Oh, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. Oh, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. It is I Narayan Singh. Come this way, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. Grimm took to his heels and the others after him, running along the two-foot parapet because the roof was hot and smoking through leaping the right-angle corner to avoid a flame that licked like a long tongue making for the middle of the rear end, where the smoke blew back, away from them, and they saw a man like the spirit of the Black Knight shouting through a brass phonograph horn thirty feet away from a roof across the narrow street. Jim Grimm. Oh, J-I-M-G-R-I-M. Here we all are. What now, Narayan Singh? Sahib, there is a ladder below you. Reach for it. Too low. Too late. The ladder lay dimly visible along a ledge ten feet below. They saw it as the roof gave in and a gust of flame scorched upward like the breath of a titanic cannon, illuminating acres. All the secret tubes for conveying drinks and information in the Star of India were carrying draft now. The core of the inferno was white hot. Kings and Ali's clothes began to burn, the others were singeing. Narayan Singh's voice through the brass horn bellowed everlastingly, emphasizing one idea over and over. For the love of God, Sahib, reach that ladder. The ladder was out of reach. I don't cook good, laughed Jeremy, amused with life even in the face of that death. I'd sooner die raw, anybody strong enough to hold my feet. Not you, Jeff, you take his it calls for two of us. Hurry, someone. Jeremy leaned on his stomach over the parapet. King seized the long Arab girdle, knotted that around his own shoulders so that the two of them were lashed together in one wrist and laid bold of Jeremy's heels. Over you go, Australia. You belong down under. Jeremy laughed and scrambled over. Ramsden laid hold of King's ankles, setting his own knees against the parapet, and to the tune of crackling flame and crashing masonry the living rope went down not slowly, for there wasn't time so fast that to the straining eyes in the street it almost looked as if they fell, and a scream of delighted dread arose to greet them. Jeremy reached the ladder, grabbed it, and it came away, adding its weight and awkwardness to the strain on Ramsden. Haul away, yelled Jeremy not laughing now. The turntable motion of the ladder in midair was swinging him and King. Jeff Ramsden's loins and back and arms cracked as he strained to the load. The others, obeying Grimm, held him by the waist and thighs to lend him leverage, Grimm holding his feet, in the post of greatest danger at the rear, where the flame roared closer every second. Quick, Sahib, quick came the voice of the Sikh through the brass horn. Ramsden strove like Samson in Philistia, the muscles of his broad back lumped up as his knees sought leverage against the parapet and King's heels rose in air. His legs would have broken if Jeff hadn't lifted him high before hauling him in. Grim, unable to endure the heat behind, put an arm around Jeff's waist and threw his own weight back at the instant when Jeff put forth his full reserve that unknown quantity that a man keeps for emergency. The ladder and the living rope came upward, and the parapet gave way. It was Grimm's arm around Jeff's waist that saved them all, for Jeff hung over by the thighs, the Afghan's hold was mainly of Jeff's garments, and they tore. The broken stone hit King and Jeremy, but glanced off harming no one until it crushed some upturned faces in the crowd. 
and Jeff's task was easier after all without the stone to lean on. He did not have to lift so high. He could pull more. King, Jeremy and Ladder came in, hand over hand. Quick, quick, oh quickly, Sahibs, came the Sikh's voice through the horn. But the heat provided impulse. There was only one way to get that ladder across from roof to roof. They had to upend it and let it fall, trusting the gods of accident, who are capricious folk, to keep the thing from breaking they clinging to the butt to prevent its bouncing over. And it fell straight with four spare rungs at either end. But it cracked with the weight of its fall, and by the light of the belching flame behind them they could see the wide split in the left-hand side piece. Someone said that Jeff should cross first because his weight was greatest and the frail bridge would endure the strain better first than last. Jeff did not argue, but lay on the ladder and crawled out to where the break was, midway. Across the midway rung he laid his belly then set his toes on the last rung he could reach behind him passed his arms through the ladder and seized with his hands the rung next but one in front. Then he tightened himself and the ladder stiffened. Come on, hurry, he shouted. They had to come two at a time, for the last of the roof was going and they stood on a shriveling small peninsula beleaguered by a tide of flame. The Afghans came afoot, for they were used to precipices and the knife-edge trails that skirt Himalayan peaks, treading along Ramsden's back as surely as they trod the rungs. But King and Grim crawled, King last. And it was when Grim's hand was almost on the farther coping, and King's weight was added to Jeff's midway, that the ladder broke. Narayan Singh had turbans and loincloths twisted through the rungs at his end long ago, and had a purchase around a piece of masonry. So only the rear end of the ladder fell to the street. King clung to Jeff's waist while the other half swung downward against the opposing wall, and the thrilled mob screamed again. Jeff King and Ladder weighed hardly less than 500 pounds between them. They went like a battering ram down the segment of an arc, spinning as the turbines up above that held them, twisted. It was the spin that saved them that in the madness of Narayan Singh, who snatched at the ladder and tried to break its fall with one hand. Both circumstances added to the fact that the ladder broke unevenly, caused it to swing leftward. It crashed into the wall, but broke again above Jeff's hands, and catapulted both men through the glass of a warehouse window, where Narayan Singh discovered them presently laughing among bales of merchandise. They shouldn't have laughed. There were more than a hundred human beings roasted in the building they had left. Maybe they laughed at the unsportsmanship of Providence. Narayan Singh was deadly serious, though unexpectedly. I watched the Portuguese. Sahibs, I thought these seven sons are not the princes of perfection they are said to be. They made a plan in that whispering gallery that you just left. But I kept my own counsel. I followed the Portuguese. I know where he went. The Portuguese has talked. The nine unknown are aware of danger. You are spied on. They knew you would come to this place. Someone in their pace set fire to the hotel and said you did it. Their agents now are telling the mob to tear you in pieces. They say you are secret agents of the Raj, who set fire to the place because a few conspirators have met there once or twice. Sahibs, if you are caught there will be short argument. They saw you from the street. Listen, they come now. What shall we do? Do, track the Portuguese, said King. How's that, Jeff? Sure, said Ramsden, something like a big dog in his readiness to follow men he liked anywhere, at any time, without the slightest argument. Chapter 4. Here's your Portuguese. They escaped by way of the roof by means of the oldest trick in Asia, which is the home of all the artifices known to man. All thieves know it, and some honest men. You join in the pursuit. You call to the human wolves to hurry. You have seen the fugitive. You wave them on, answering questions with a gesture, saving breath to follow too, glaring with indignant eyes, impatient of delay, but overtaken past. So, falling to the rear, you face about at last and, while the wolves yelp, on a hot trail in the wrong direction, you walk quietly in the right one yours the opposite away. They found a stair down to the street through the house of a seller of burlap, who was edified to learn that they were authorized inspectors. He obeyed their recommendation to shut his roof door tight. They took some samples of his goods to prove, as they said, by laboratory tests that the fire risk in his house was nothing serious, which made him feel immensely friendly. And out in the street they became customers of the burlap merchant, hurrying home after a belated bargain bearing samples and excuse that let them through the fire line formed of regiments just arrived, whose business seemed to be to drive every one the way he did not want to go. So presently, behind the drawn up regiments, they threaded a thinning crowd toward the north, leaving the tumult and the honking motor horns behind. The streets grew dimly lighted and mysterious, to Jeremy's enormous joy. His passion is pursuit of everything unconventional. They strode down echoing alleys where no European ever goes, unless there is a murder or a riot too high tensioned for the regular police. 
They stopped and ate awful food in a place where sunlight never penetrated, drinking alongside surly ruffians, who sat on their knives in order to keep conscious of them all the time. The way they took out by taverns out of which the stink of most abominable liquor oozed raw, reeking ullage with the King of England's portrait on a label on the bottle where women screamed obscenities and yelled in mockery of their own jokes places where the Portuguese had held his nightlife and had not been loved. Time and again Narayan Singh, with a sheepskin coat hung loosely on his shoulder as a shield, peered into a den sometimes opium, sometimes drink was the reek that greeted him to inquire whether the Portuguese had headed back that way by any chance. Invariably he was cursed, and certain gods were thanked, by way of answer. One could gather that Dagama was not liked even relatively in the places he frequented. Narayan Singh, full of his office of guide, and proud of his accomplishment in having found and blazed Dagama's trail, visited every haunt the Portuguese frequented, talking between whiles. It was here they sat, Sahib he and the man who gave orders to the others who carried the books. And the Portuguese told all about our meeting in the office, I listening, pretending to be drunk so drunk along the floor they all but trod on me. Dagama desired to play you on a hook, saying he needed money from you. Therefore the other said nay, Sahib, I never saw him before, and don't know who he is, but he wore yellow. The other said the nine will give Dagama money, if he will go to a place he knows of, where he will discover it left in a bag for him. The Portuguese asked how should he believe that. And the other answered that neither the nine nor any agents of the nine tell lies for any reason, moreover, the other added that all you sahibs and your servants by whom he meant Ali and his sons and me will be roasted to death within an hour or two. So I rolled out of this kana asterisk into the gutter, which is cleaner, and as soon as I had watched Dagama to another place I ran to warn you. Let us only hope he has not escaped this between then and now. Asterisk a word meaning almost any kind of place. Can't, laughed Jeremy. He's no more than a shilling up a conjurer's sleeve. Process of elimination gives the answer. So they harked along Dogama's trail into a rather better quarter of the city, where the ladies of undoubtful reputation ply the oldest trade without severely straining any caste laws. Priests lie sadly thereabouts. Whoever entertains a Sikh, for instance, or Mohammedan, or Hindu of a lower caste than hers, may regain purity for payment which is very shocking to the civilized, who only buy seats in the Senate, or perhaps a title, or who, use their pull with the press to hush up things the public shouldn't know. There, in a rather wider street, in a house that had gilded shutters, they sat cross-legged on embroidered cushions vis-a-vis -vis to a lady sometimes known as Gori, which is a heavenly name. She was pretty besides inquisitive, and the turquoise stud in the curve of one side of her nose contributed a piquancy that offset petulance. Her vials of vituperation were about full, and she outpoured almost at the mention of Dog Emma's name. Know him. Know that slime of adder stuffed into a yellow skin. She wished she did not. But who were the gentlemen, first, who wished to know about him? Men whom he had robbed. Amazing. What a mystery, that such a Pashu asterisk as that Portuguese could win the confidence of anyone and steal as much as one rupee. Yet he had robbed her truly. Her, a lady of no little experience he had robbed her of a thousand rupees as lately as yesterday. He had laughed at her today. The beast had spent her fortune. Practically all her savings, except for a jewel or two. Asterisk unmitigated brute having neither soul nor conscience a very comprehensive Hindi word. And he had robbed others. Although it served the others right, vowing fidelity to her the brute he had intrigued elsewhere, as she had only just discovered, coaxing other women's savings from them. What did he use the money for? To bribe the priest servants to bring him old books out of temple, smelly old books full of magic and ancient history. He said that if he can get the right book he can find so much money in one place that all the rest of the wealth in the world wouldn't be a candle to it. She was to have a tenth of all that. She supposed he made the other women equally tempting offers. As a Raja on his throne might feel toward a dead dog on a dung heap, so she felt toward Dagama. She wished the Lords of Death no evil, but she hoped they might have the Portuguese, nevertheless. He had come that afternoon and laughed at her. She had asked him for a little of her money back, and he had mocked her to her face. He had boasted flatly that she would never see one Anna of her money back, and had then gone, mocking her even from the street. Whereat Jeremy, adept at following the disappearing shilling, hinted to King in a whisper. So King made a suggestion, and the priestess of delight blew cigarette smoke through her nose in two straight, illustrative snorts. She hid that Pashu in her house now after all that had happened. There was a day when she had hidden him a day born in the womb of bitterness, begotten of regret. How vastly wiser she would have been to leave him to the knives of the men he had robbed. He was always a thief. 
She knew that now, although then she had thought he was persecuted. King made another suggestion, launching innuendo deftly on the ways of jest as he accepted sherbet from the gory's maid. She looked as if she wished the drink were poisoned, and retorted without any button on her rapier. Thug, you would like to search my house to steal the Portuguese's leavings. There is nothing. He took all, and it would cost me 300 rupees to the priest to repurify the place if I let such as you go through it. Now a fool would have taken her statement at face value, believing or disbelieving as the case might be, and learning nothing. A clever fool would have paid 300 for the privilege to search, learning that the Portuguese was not there, but otherwise no wiser after it. Wisdom, yoked up with experience, paid attention to the price she quoted and, not liking to be cheated, doubled the price and made a game of it. For, although all cheat him who buys, and some cheat the gambler, the odds against the gambler are so raised already by the gods that some folk let it go at that. 300 for the priest. I'll bet 600 you don't know where the Portuguese is now. Said King. Her eyes snapped. Tell for less than a thousand. She retorted scornfully. I am not a spy. But I am a gambler, King answered. I offered to bet. I will bet you 500 you don't know where Dogama is this minute. You said 600. Now I bet five. In a minute I reduce my stake to four. Next minute three, I have no money to bet with, she answered. Dogama has it all. Yet, if you were betting on a certainty you wouldn't lose, so you could afford to stake your jewelry, King answered. I will bet five hundred rupees against that necklace of pearls that you can't tell me where the Portuguese is. Who would hold the stakes? She asked hesitating. That was a poser, but Ali of Sikandarum was ready for it. He drew forth his silver-hilted knife and made the blade ring on the floor. You hold them, he said, looking hard at her upwind, the way he was used to viewing the peaks of Sikandarum. If my friend wins, I come to claim the stakes. I am old in the ways of women, and I come with this in my right hand. Only if you win you keep the stakes. She judged his eyes, and understood, and nodded. King laid on the carpet five one hundred rupee notes. She laid her necklace opposite. Ali of Sikandarum raked all the lot together with the point of his weapon and then pushed them toward her. She put on the necklace and folded the notes. I could send my maid, she said. The place is indescribable. But the maid of any such mistress as Gori is more untrustworthy than treachery itself. Having nothing to lose, and the world before her, her eccentric trickery is guaranteed. I deal with principles. I bet with you, said King. I cannot go there. I am afraid to go there. It is too far, exclaimed Gori. It was my maid, not I who followed him. She knows the way. I. Ali of Sikandarum ran a thumbnail down the keen edge of his knife, and Gori shuddered, but it was Narayan Singh who voiced the right solution. He leaned over and touched the nearest of Ali's sons, who was daydreaming over the maid's delightfulness, perhaps imagining her likeness in the Muslim paradise. Two horses, he commanded, instantly. The youngster came to with a start and glanced at his sire, who nodded. King produced money. Gori claimed it. Let the owner of the horses send his bill to me. She insisted, and nearly enough to have bought two horses disappeared into a silken mystery between her breasts. So Ali's youngest went on an errand he could run without much risk of tripping up, but instantly, is a word of random application and he was gone an hour before the horses stood in curiously at the door perceived by half a hundred very curious eyes, for the doings of a lady such as Gory are of deeper interest than chronicles of courts. It was not until Ramsden came forth bulking like a Raja's bully, and the others formed up like the riff-raff hirelings who attended to the unprintable pursuits of aristocracy, that the crowd went its way to imagine the rest and discuss it over Batelnet or water pipes. Gory ceased expostulating when it dawned on her that she would ride escorted by nine assorted footmen. That is an honor and a novelty that comes to few of her position on the stairs of disrepute. And then, there was intrigue, that was meat and drink to her. There was the possibility, the probability of venomous revenge, and a bet to win, if no chance of her money back from the Portuguese. She began to try to stipulate before the hour was up. If I find him for you, you must kill him. She insisted. If you don't find him, you lose your necklace, King retorted. What if he tells you his secrets? She said suddenly. The Pashu will be afraid. He will tell the secret of the treasure. He has had ten thousand rupees of my money. You must tell me what he tells you. She grew silent looking reading men and faces, as the third of her profession was. King's eyes had met Grimm's and the glance passed all around the circle.